Okay, so let's talk about primarily the four phases because that's um, a very good way of using remedies in women according to the four phases of the menstrual cycle. Okay, so let's talk about the uterus, first of all, the nature of menstrual blood and the four phases, primarily. The uterus is found at one of the six extra foo, and the uterus, as you can see here, is called the bao. Bao means, bao is an envelope, some, a container. Bao gives the idea of envelope, container, and the means baby. So the baby container is the uterus. An important thing here is that this bow structure, which is in the lower dantian, is common to men and women. Okay, so men have it too. So the bow in women is the zi bao, the uterus. In men, the bow is the room of jing, which you could also translate as room of sperm. So that produces sperm and that produces menstrual blood. So sperm and menstrual blood are both tian gui. We'll see in a moment what tian gui is. Okay. For example, the very first chapter of the Su Wen says, when a girl is 14, the chung is flourishing and the ren is open, the tian gui arrives, the menstrual blood arrives, and she can conceive. When a boy is 16, the same, the chung is flourishing, the ren is open, and the tian gui arrives, the sperm arrives, and he can conceive, 14 and 16. So there is an equivalence here between sperm and menstrual blood. So in women, menstrual blood is not blood. The famous gynecology, Fu Qingju, always stressed that very much. He said menstrual blood is not blood, it is water. And by water he meant kidney jing. It is a direct manifestation of kidney jing, and it's a precious fluid. So if a woman cuts herself, that blood there is not tian gui, that's blood. But the menstrual blood is not like that blood, it is tian gui, okay? Which comes directly from jing, equivalent to sperm in men. But there is an important <coughs> uh, thing to remember here is that when the ancient Chinese books talk about the uterus, it really includes the ovaries. So when we talk about uterus in gynecology and Chinese medicine, it's in inverted commas, including ovaries. So Tian Gui in women is menstrual blood, but obviously it is not only menstrual blood, but also the eggs. The eggs that are produced every month would be a manifestation of Tian Gui. But the old books refer to menstrual blood being a precious fluid. And as I said, this gynecology Fu Qingju stressed it all the time. Most people think that menstrual blood is blood. They said that's wrong. Menstrual blood is water. And in fact, that's why it's called Tian Gui, because this Gui, which is untranslatable, is actually the tenth stem, which not by chance pertains to water. And Tian means heavenly. So the heavenly gui, the heavenly stem, which pertains to water. Another interesting conclusion you can draw from this very simple diagram is that, that in women, in the lower dantian, there is the uterus, which is a physical structure which stores blood, so it's full of blood. In men, there is the room of jing, but the room of jing is not the physical structure, what is the room of jing? We know that sperm is not made in the lower dantian. <coughs> It's made partly in the prostate, partly in the testicles. So, you could say that in women, the lower dantian is full, in inverted commas, or full of blood. In men, the lower dantian is empty. But there's nothing there, there's no uterus. Which means that women are far more prone to blood stasis than men. And there's a very important consideration from this very simple diagram. In women, in gynecology, if you want uh, an advice, never underestimate blood stasis, even when you think it's not that obvious. It's a very important pathogenic factor, sometimes not that obvious. 
for example, after childbirth, you see a woman after childbirth, childbirth is very taxing on qi and blood, especially qi. So your first instinct is to get tonify qi and blood, right? She's exhausted, she just had a baby, wrong. You need to move blood, eliminate blood stasis. Why? Because after childbirth, it is very likely that there are bits left over, bits of placenta left over, bits of blood left over in the uterus, and you need to eliminate. So invigorate blood and eliminate blood stasis. As a very rough rule of thumb, within three weeks of the birth, concentrate on reinvigorating blood. After three weeks, you concentrate on nourishing blood. Obviously, immediately after childbirth, you would not only invigorate blood, but I would primarily invigorate blood, secondarily nourish blood. Other example, I can give you a case history of a woman with heavy menstrual bleeding, burned low, bleeding all the time, and the bleeding was clearly from qi deficiency, and I gave her remedies to treat that, restrain the flow, nothing worked. The only remedy that stopped bleeding was the remedy invigorate blood and stem the flow, which moves blood, paradoxically. We'll see in a moment why. Okay? So, as a rule of thumb, as a general advice, do not overlook blood stasis as a pathogenic factor in women. Okay? Now, the heart is related to the uterus through a channel called the palme. And palme means uh, uterus vessel. There is a debate whether this palme is a separate channel or whether it is part of the chung mei. Personally, I think it's part of the chung mei, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is that heart, qi, and heart blood go down to the uterus. And the menstrual function relies a lot on that heart and kidneys axis. The menstrual blood that we talked about does not come from the liver. The liver stores it. But it's not blood, it's tiangui, and it comes from the kidneys. Okay? So the menstrual phase is the menstrual function. There wouldn't be any menstrual phase or menstrual function without the kidneys because they are the origin of Tiangui. And as we will see in a moment, the four phases are an alternation of yin and yang, and it's yin and yang of the kidneys, primarily. Okay? And the kidneys are connected to the uterus through a channel called Bao Luo, the Luo of the uterus. And heart qi and heart blood go down. And we'll see in a moment what else the heart does in the four phases. Now, there is something I'd like to clarify on the origin. Okay, we don't need to go through this. The origin of Tiangui. Yeah, this one. So, Tiangui comes from kidney water, kidney jing, the water of the kidneys but it does need the fire of the minister fire for that transformation to happen. So menstrual blood, Tiangui, is a transformation of kidney jing, of the water of the kidneys, and that transformation needs the fire of the kidneys, the minister fire, the physiological fire of the kidneys. It's a process of crystallization. An ancient book actually talked about crystallization. And if you imagine this is a container of water with a salt, with a lot of salt in it, so that's kidney jing. Okay, the water is kidney jing. You apply a flame to it, a small flame. After some hours, the water will evaporate and you're left with salt crystals. Okay? And that's what happens to the tiangui. The salt, cri the salt crystals are tiangui, which derives from water under the influence of some heat. 
the, the minister file. And in fact, one of the old doctors uses exactly that word, crystallization. He says, Tian Gui is a crystallization of kidney water under the action of kidney fire. The important uh, implication of this is that in women, in my experience, a kidney deficiency often involves both. It's never one or the other, especially women over 40. To that, uh, that the kidneys are the origin of yin and yang. And when the yin is deficient, often the yang is also deficient and vice versa. Which can happen only in the kidneys because they are the origin of yin and yang. You can't have that in the heart. You can't have heart yang shu and heart yin shu. That's impossible. Or oh, liver yang shu and liver yin shu or spleen, stomach. It can only happen in the kidneys because they are the origin of water and fire. And this water and fire are not antagonistic. This minister fire, this, this physiological fire, is a special type of fire that does not dry up water. It does not dry up. Besides many of the other things that the heart does in the menstrual cycle, according to Fu Ching Ju, heart yang also descends the uterus to help that transformation. <coughs> so let's look at the four phases of the menstrual cycle, and these are primarily ideas from Dr. Xia, XIA, from Nanjing. The four phases are not actually a, uh, a traditional uh, in traditional Chinese gynecology. And Dr. Xia is one of the main doctors who, have, uh, who has elaborated this theory. And these are the four phases. You should remember those numbers because I will refer to them as phase one, two, three, and four. And phase one is the bleeding time, <clears throat> the bleeding itself. Phase two, roughly a week after the end of bleeding. Phase three, the next week, mid-cycle, when ovulation occurs, the beginning of that. And phase four, roughly a week before the period. So if the duration of the period is 28 days, 30 days, those are roughly a week each. This is usually five days, so that leaves only two days out. Okay, 21, 3, 7, 7, 21 plus 5 would be uh, 26. Okay, so this is roughly a week each. Of course, it doesn't have to be that rigid, as we will see in a moment. These phases can actually stretch or contract. But for the time being, let's look at it in the theoretical way. And these lines are theoretical lines. It must be stressed. In practice, they wouldn't really look like that at all. But in order to understand the four phases, it's good to look at these theoretical lines first. For example, we got the yin, start, the yin minimum here. Okay? In reality, that blue line should start about there, towards the end of bleeding. That's when yin is its, its minimum. Okay? So these lines are theoretical, but they are very useful to understand the physiology of the four phases. And as you can see very clearly, the four phases are due simply to, they are like an ebb and tide, um, like the sea, under the influence of the moon. When the yin comes up, the yang goes down, and vice versa. And this yin and yang here is the yin and yang of the kidneys. Without kidney jing, there would be no menstrual phases. Okay. So as you can see very clearly here, in the middle of the cycle, yin has reached its maximum, yang its minimum, and then they switch over. Yang rises and yin decreases. And you could actually interpret every menstrual irregularity very simply in terms of yin and yang. For example, ovulation is delayed. This cycle is stretched. It's 45 days because ovulation is delayed, it could be from a lack of yang. Yang is not increasing enough. Or yin is not decreasing. 
What does it mean, yin, in the uterus? Phlegm, for example. The uterus could be a phlegm, which is excess yin, which prevents the decrease of yin. So the ovulation doesn't come. You could explain any menstrual irregularity very simply in terms of yin and yang. Premenstrual symptoms are not all due to liver cheese stagnation, as people think. See that yang is rising sharply here. It, yang could be rising too much. You can have premenstrual symptoms from heart fire. Vice versa, you could have premenstrual syndrome from yang not rising enough. Spleen and kidney yang shu can give you premenstrual symptoms as well. Okay? So these lines are theoretical lines, but they're very good to understand the physiology of the four phases. And, going back to the heart, the heart does two very important things. So the four phases depend, first of all, on the kidneys. Without kidneys, there wouldn't be any Tiangui. But they also depend on the communication between the kidneys and the heart. Because you see these times here, that one and that one. Here there is a switch from yang to yin, relatively sudden switch from yang to yin. And here there is a switch from yin to yang. So there are moments of transformation. And they are then under the influence of the heart. So it could be that ovulation is delayed because heart chi is not going down to communicate with the kidneys to induce the ovulation. Or it's going down too early. She could have heart fire. It's going down too early. The ovulation is anticipated. So. The heart has that important function, going down to the kidneys to <coughs> promote to in, in that transformation from yang to yin and yin to yang, these two moments of transformation. You can see this very clearly. This explains, you see here, the yang has reached its maximum, and then it, it goes down quite rapidly. That explains how a woman can have a lot of premenstrual symptoms, and they can disappear with the onset of the period, when they do disappear, that's because of this sudden switch from yang to yin. The that the yes, I would, therapy? definitely would. Like Dan Shen, just one herb, Dan so Shen. To yeah, to help the blood, heart blood as well, liver blood. Obviously in blood stasis you need to treat the liver, because yeah. the liver stores blood, and the pathology of blood stasis involves the liver and the chung mei. But I would nearly always have Dan Shen. Oh, one for the heart? Yeah. Probably. Most probably I would have one for the heart as well. But Dan Gui enters the heart as well anyway. Okay. Dan Gui enters the heart. And blood, heart blood heat? Heart blood heat, I would use uh, probably something like Ju Ye for the heart. Um, Something else that would differ in these lines from these theoretical lines is the steepness of them. They're not so symmetrical. This one here, for example, this young line would actually go down more steeply like that, probably. Okay. And the yin would be at its minimum, minimum there. Okay. So in practice they would look differently. Plus, Dr. Shah says that there are Within these cycles, there are little cycles. So this line, in reality, would look like that, like a zigzag line, or up and down, like that. Um, no, I don't. Uh, yes, it would look like that. More like that. There are little cycles within the cycles. Okay, so let's see. Um, what happens in each phase? And we look at this. Yes. In the four phases, yang sort of hits its, its bottom where ovulation should be. Mm -hmm. But that's when progesterone should kick in, and theoretically, that should raise the temperature right up yeah. at ovulation. So how do you correlate? Yeah, th that's why this is a theoretical line. It's theoretical. So this 
young line would probably fall down more steeply there, okay? F bottom out there, but start rising about there, like that. So these are theoretical lines. Because ovulation occurs towards the beginning of phase three, and there is a sharp rise in temperature actually immediately after ovulation. So this should be go down more steeply, flatten out there, and then start rising there. And then here, rise more steeply, and then flatten out. Okay? Yes, because if you look at this, it doesn't really fit in with the horizon temperature and the progesterone. Okay, so let's look at what happens in each phase, because that's very relevant for the choice of remedy. And phase one is the bleeding. There's a maximum of yang at the very beginning of it, and yang decreases rapidly. Important here in phase one is this. Qi and blood are moving downwards. The pace is occurring. So there is a downward movement, not only of blood, but also of qi. And this downward movement activity is centered on the xiaofu. This is the xiaofu, which, which means small abdomen. And this is the xiaofu, these two lateral ones. So in phase one, the activity is centered right there, on the renmei, okay? with the downward movement of qi and blood. And there's a transformation from yang to yin. Yang is decreasing and yin is increasing. Under the influence of the heart for the discharge of menstrual blood. So the downward flow of heart, qi and blood towards the kidneys is necessary for the discharge of menstrual blood, for the beginning of the period. So the period may be delayed because heart, qi and heart blood are not going down. It may be early, if there is heart fire and it goes down too much. Okay? Now, the important thing in here is the treatment principle. In each phase, you can identify a different treatment principle. And I cannot stress enough how useful this is in practice. So, in phase, phase one is the best time to invigorate blood. I use this word advisedly, invigorate blood, rather than moving blood. Uh, there is a whole category of herbs, which are usually called moving blood herbs. I prefer the term invigorating blood, which Bensky also uses, because these herbs don't actually move blood around in the arteries, but they change the quality of the blood. Yeah, I mean, Yen Hu Suo, Dan Shen, um, Wu Yao, Wu Ling Zhe, all those moving blood herbs. Mu Dan Pi Zhe Shao. And in terms of remedies, the remedy that moves blood, that I have that invigorates blood, is Stir Field of Elixir. You have here, you should have. You have this diagram, but you also have the following one on the following page with the remedies for each phase. But let's look at this first. Let's not look at the remedies. So phase one is the best time to invigorate blood. So if a woman has blood stasis, it is a good time to treat it during the periods. But, there's an important but, not if the period is heavy. Because if the period is heavy and you invigorate blood, you make it heavier. So, it is a good idea to invigorate blood in women during phase one for blood stasis if the period is normal or scanty. And the remedy to invigorate blood is stir field of elixir. Stir field of elixir. But if the period is heavy, we have a very good four or five or six herbs which simultaneously invigorate blood and stop bleeding. And the remedy that does that is called 
invigorate blood and stem the flow. And it is a very useful remedy because it does that. It treats blood stasis but also stops bleeding. And it's very common for women to have excessive menstrual bleeding and blood stasis. Invigorate blood and stem the flow, it is called. So, in other words, to summarize, to put it simply, invigorating blood is good in phase one. If the period is no more scanty, use sterile field of elixir. If the period is heavy, you use invigorate blood and stem the flow. Is that clear? Yeah. They are safe, there is no unsafe, but I don't treat women, I mean, we are safe we are trying to conceive in case they get pregnant. Yes. Some are, some are not. It's, it should, you should have a slide there with the remedies contraindicated in pregnancy at the end. No, you don't. In the, in the manual, but you have it in the manual anyway, and you also will have that on the disc. But it will also be on the disc. It's also on the disc, yeah. Okay, so the two remedies I have from phase one are stir field of elixir or invigorate blood and stem the flow. Okay, in phase two, uh, blood and yin are relatively empty obviously because the woman has been bleeding. The stress here is in the word relatively, which means what? That at this time of the month, blood is empty in relation to other times. It does not mean that every woman at the end of the period suffers from blood shoe. It's not a pathology. Is that clear? It does not mean that every woman at the end of the period has blurred vision and numbness and... Okay. It simply means that if you look at those lines, compared to other times of the month, blood and yin are relatively empty. Yin is beginning to grow. By the way, you can correlate the yin of the menstrual cycle to estrogen and the yang of the menstrual cycle to progesterone. Generally speaking, I am cautious with these parallels between Chinese and Western medicine, but in, in this case, you can do it. I think it makes sense to correlate kidney yin in the menstrual cycle with estrogen <coughs> and kidney yang with progesterone. So yin is growing, which reflects what Western gynecology calls the follicular phase, which is making the eggs grow. And it's also the crossroads of yin and yang. The most important thing about this phase is this, according to Dr. Xia, Phase two is an important phase to treat a woman with menstrual problems, to establish a good menstrual cycle. And if I'm treating a menstrual problem, infertility or scanty periods or irregular periods or painful periods, nearly always I will give a remedy here in phase two, a kidney tonic, even if they don't have obvious symptoms of kidney deficiency. Because, according to Dr. Xia, this sets the kind of the, 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 the um, a basis for a good regular menstrual cycle. So it's an important time to treat. And what you treat in phase two, you nourish blood and or tonify the kidneys. So if you want to nourish blood in a woman, that's the best time to do it. There's not much point in nourishing blood in phase one when you're losing blood, right? So that's the best, most important time to do it with the blood tonic. An example of blood tonics, I have many blood tonics. Uh, a general one is precious C. Precious C. 
which is a variation of the famous Bajan Tang, the eight precious pill, or Bajan one. But there are many other blood tonic. For example, the remedy to calm the Shen that we saw for mental emotional problems nourishes heart, blood, and liver blood. It has also gynecological uses, in fact. Calm the Shen, nourishes heart, blood, and liver blood, and can be used actually to stop excessive menstrual bleeding deriving from tissue. To nourish blood in that time, I use precious teas. To tonify the kidneys, as you mentioned, I use either unicorn pearl, which is for kidney yang, or growing jade, which is for kidney yin. So tonifying the kidneys, that could mean either yin or yang. I repeat, unicorn pearl for kidney yang and growing jade for kidney yin. Why do we use these two and not strengthen the root and nourish the root? You remember, strengthen the root is for kidney <coughs> yang and nourish the root for kidney yin. You can use those two as well. But unicorn pearl and growing jade are more gynecological. They're specific for women. They have herbs with nice blood as well, tonify the uterus. So there are two kidney tonics, yang and yin, which are better for women. Okay, unicorn pearl and growing jade. Phase three, what happens? Chung, Ren, and Du are in full activity to promote ovulation. So ovulation, which in Chinese, in Western mass is under the control of the estrogen, in Chinese mass is under the control of the Chung, Ren, and Du. They are in, remember that, notice that the Du, the influence of the Du is often overlooked in gynecology. Yang is rising sharply, which is reflected in the rise of temperature immediately after ovulation. Yin reaches its maximum and then it decreases. And at this time, just before ovulation, you have a transparent secretion. And let's look at that for a moment. That is the vaginal secretion, the cervical secretion rather. It's interesting here, see this is the end of the period, here you have a relative dryness which reflects what we just said, blood and yin are relatively empty. And then as you get approach phase three, there's a transparent slippery mucus like egg white. And that if when women come to me for infertility, I always ask them to check that. So Dr. Xia gives great, attaches great importance to this. Because that is Tiangui, is a manifestation of Tiangui, and it should be there. So if this transparent secretion is absent, by definition that indicates a kidney deficiency. Or if even if it is too short, say it's one day rather than three or four. Not to be confused with a vaginal discharge. This is not the vaginal discharge. It's a normal mucus. It's transparent and sticky and stringy. Uh, Jen Littleton, in the book, she's written a book on infertility. There is a picture of it as well. And Dr. Shia attaches great importance to that. He always asks a woman about that, if it is there and how many days. OK? So that should appear at the, very, at the beginning of phase three. In reality, you could, within phase three, you could distinguish two phases, in fact, within three. Uh, if you go back to that line, why two phases? Because here at the beginning of phase three, you have a sharp rise in yang. This yellow line should start going up from there go up sharp, then ovulation occurs, and then it settles down a bit. So it's within phase three, you can distinguish two phases. One is the ovulation itself, and two is the post-ovulation phase. Okay, But it's not necessary to do that in terms of treatment. So in terms of treatment, phase three is the time to tonify the kidneys. 
Oh, but uh, phase three, the physiological activity is centered in the Shaofu area. There. And qi and blood are actually going up. That's why there could be some breast distension and some feeling of heat. So you could compare phase three with phase one. In both phase one and three, there is a lot of activity. Phase one is going down and it's in the Xiaofu. Phase three is in the Xiaofu and it's going up. Qi and blood are going up, partly through, primarily through the Chung Mei. So the treatment principle is tonify the kidneys, strengthen Chung, Ren, and Du, tonify the spleen is necessary, resolve dampness if necessary. So I use phase three to resolve damp phlegm in the uterus. And the remedy I use a lot is clear, um, clear the palace. So if I was tonifying the kidneys in a woman, basically I would use both phase two and three. Or, supposing you want to tonify the kidneys in a woman, but also resolve damp phlegm, which is the situation in uh, post, uh, polycystic ovary, I would tonify the kidneys in phase, through, phase two, resolve damp phlegm in phase three, with clear the palace. Okay. Phase four is the premenstrual phase. Yang is rising rapidly. Qi is moving. And that movement of Qi prepares the body for the movement of blood in phase one. And this movement of Qi is under the influence of the liver. But the rising of Yang is also under the influence of the heart. The rising of Yang in this phase is important to warm the uterus to eliminate potential in pathogenic factors such as blood stasis, cold or phlegm. So the treatment principle here is to move qi or warm the uterus or invigorate blood. Examples, let's say a simple example, blood stasis, you choose the periods are normal or scanty, you choose stir field of elixir, and I would use it in phase four and one. Stir field of elixir in phases four and one. Or let's say this woman has cold in the uterus. The formula for cold in the uterus is warm the menses. Warm the menses. I would use it primarily in phases four and perhaps also one. Okay. In terms of using your emotional remedies, the one that you talked this morning, would you use that also according to the cycle? Yes, if yes. For example, yeah, very much so. For example, let's take an example. Uh, what example? Searching soul. You remember searching soul tonifies liver blood and liver chi. I would use it in phase two primarily and three, and not the other phases. Uh, another example, drain fire, for example, or settling soul. You remember settling the soul drains liver fire and heart fire. I would use that in phase probably four and one. Okay. I'm not saying that you always have to use remedies according to the phases in women, but for gynecological problems, definitely. To treat endometriosis, for example, and polycystic ovary is as absolutely essential to treat according to the four phases. How would you treat endometriosis? We're going to talk about it. Um, if we have time. In fact, we, we will have time. I will talk about it. So
So in your handout, you have this um, slide here, which gives you the remedies for each phase. Do not interpret this too rigidly. Okay. It does not mean that you can't use clear depolarizing phase two in one, okay? or it is dangerous. So do not interpret this list too rigidly. OK, let's actually use endometriosis as an example of treating the corn to the faces. 97% uh, of women with endometriosis will have painful periods. So that's a major symptom of it. And this is also important. 47% of them have infertility. So endometriosis is a major cause of infertility. <coughs> and the other symptoms are, depend on the location of the endometrial tissue. It can be near the rectum, for example, or on the ov around the ovaries, etc. OK? This is all Western. Let's see it from the Chinese medicine point of view. Etiology, intercourse during menstruation. By the way, I did, forgot to mention this morning, or this afternoon, actually. You remember, Tiangui is menstrual blood in women and sperm in men. That makes a big difference in the effect of sexual activity, i.e., the cause of disease of excessive sexual activity does not really apply to women as it does to men. For the obvious reason that during sexual activity, men lose sperm, which is Tiangui. But during sexual activity, women don't lose menstrual blood and don't lose eggs, which are Tiangui. So it does not have the same effect. However, there are two important, two frequent common uh, sexual causes of disease in women. And this is one of them, intercourse during menstruation. That creates blood stasis. It creates blood stasis because with sexual arousal, the minister goes up. But in phase one, as we've seen, chi and blood are going down. So one is going down, one is going up, and there's blood stasis as a result. Another cause of possible problems is early sexual activity. And by early, mean around puberty or even before puberty. That damages the Chung and Ren and may lead to blood stasis as well later on in life. So excessive sexual activity does not really apply to women, but the two main sexual causes of disease would be these two, intercourse during menstruation and early sexual activity. It damages Chung and Ren uh, because at that time, during puberty, the uterus is in a vulnerable condition, in a changing condition. So it could create blood stasis, sometimes could create dampness or phlegm, one of these. Okay, another cause is excessive physical work or exercise which may weaken kidney yang and weaken the Chung and Ren. External cold, very important etiological factor. Cold easily invades the uterus around puberty time and also during each period. Common, very common cause of blood stasis in women, for especially young women, young girls with painful periods, nearly always due to this external cold invading the uterus. Swimming. Yes, very much so. Especially swimming without changing your swimming costume immediately afterwards, keeping it wet on even if it's summertime. Especially if it's during the period. Or before or just after. <coughs> or before or just after and at puberty time, even worse. Or after childbirth as well. The uterus is more vulnerable. The uterus is more vulnerable at puberty, after childbirth, and during every period. And the last cause of disease is tampons, which also tend to block the downward flow of qi and blood, 
By the way, something I forgot to mention, um, tampons may block the downward flow of Qian blood, and that could lead to what Dr. Xia calls retention of menses, i.e. not enough bleeding. And that's a very important concept because we are instinctively worried about heavy bleeding. Say if a woman is bleeding for nine days or is bleeding very heavily, you instinctively want to do everything possible to stop it, right? But if she, and you panic. But if she's bleeding for three days, you don't panic. But you should, because that is as serious as heavy bleeding, because it leads to retention of menses and potentially endometriosis. Now the path. Pian Zhang means identifying the pattern, the second one, which is what we do all the time. You diagnose liver chew stagnation, kidney yang shu, heart, blood, heart blood shu, heart fire, etc., etc. That's Pian Zhang. But we don't often do Pian Bing, i.e. identifying the disease. The disease in the Chinese sense. For example, in gynecology, if you look at my gynecology book, each chapter is a disease. But is a disease in inverted commas, because there are diseases in the Chinese sense, not in the Western sense. For example, painful periods is a disease in Chinese gynecology. Short periods, heavy periods, long periods, irregular periods, um, heavy periods, so they're all diseases. Infertility is a disease. And another disease is abdominal masses, uh, which are called, in women, are called jiangjia. There's two types. And the jung are the masses from blood stasis. Now, in the ancient times, how would the Chinese doctor diagnose abdominal masses? In the ancient times, in the Qing dynasty, or Ming, or Song. Sorry? No, no, abdominal masses. Through palpations, exactly. A doctor would diagnose abdominal masses through palpations. You palpate them, right? But what if you have a very small ovarian cyst which is not palpable? Is that an abdominal mass? You say yes. Then does anyone say yes or no? <laughs> A, print, uh, a myoma, a small myoma, a small fibroid, it's not palpable. Is that an abdominal mass? Yeah, I would agree. I would say yes. The implication of that is that we are using a Western diagnosis to identify a Chinese disease. Is that legitimate? Yes. I think so. Why not? <laughs> the myoma is not palpable. In the Qing dynasty, a doctor... Of, um, Say, in the Qing scene, a woman had endometriosis with painful periods. A doctor would have diagnosed the Bian Ping would have been painful periods, right? But as she had an abdominal, palpable abdominal mass, mass the doctor in the Qing dynasty would have said, oh, this is a case of Zheng Jia, of the Zheng type. Now, I'm saying all this, why? Because all the modern Chinese doctors say that endometriosis, the bian ping in endometriosis, is actually abdominal masses, not painful periods. Is that clear? All modern Chinese doctors say that the bian ping in endometriosis, the bian ping of the Chinese bian ping of endometriosis, is abdominal masses not painful periods. Is that clear? What is the implication of that? The implication of that is that for abdominal masses from blood stasis, you need to use herbs that break blood. Break blood. Not just invigorate blood. These are, the, the herbs that break blood obviously invigorate blood, but they are stronger. Western diagnosis as well, doesn't it? 
Yes. Yeah. Basically, what we are doing here, we're using a Western diagnosis to make a Chinese PM ping. Some people would say, you can't do that. I would say, why not? And what does that mean? It means that you need to use herbs that break blood. They're stronger. Examples are Urju and Sun Lung. They're two very commonly used, which are the herbs which I have in Harmonizing the Moon. So, in other words, I'm saying all this because Harmonizing the Moon, which is the remedy for endometriosis, the Piao of endometriosis, invigorates blood and breaks blood. For abdominal masses, is a variation of a formula for abdominal masses. Even though, I repeat, in women with endometriosis, normally there's nothing palpable. Okay? So that's the significance of all that. Can you use Where would you use this in the cycle? I, normally, I'm, I, I seldom tell people to stop uh, you know, Western drugs. But in the case of gynecology, there is no point because the Chinese herbs work by regulating the four phases and that indirectly is treating the hormones. Indirectly. There is no point in trying to regulate the hormones with Chinese herbs if you're taking hormones. No point at all. Even more so if you're taking Danusol, which is this treatment for uh, endometriosis, because that stops the periods completely. So it doesn't always stop the pain. It doesn't always stop pain, and so there is no point, in my opinion, in com in that case, in combining with Chinese medicine. Not because there is any contradiction, but there is no point. That's why I made all that diversion. All modern Chinese doctors say that you treat endometriosis as if it was a case of abdominal masses which means you need to break blood, and that's what harmonizing the moon does. These are some recommendations for the treatment of endometriosis. There is always blood stasis, but especially if there is infertility due to endometriosis, there are other factors, and especially kidney yang shu. In treatment, place the emphasis on blood stasis, especially if the period is very painful. There is always a kidney deficiency. Retention of menses is an important factor, as Dr. Xia says. And as we will see in a moment, the temperature chart is flat in endometriosis. We'll look at that in a moment. Another factor in endometriosis is young not growing enough during phase four, and that's why sometimes I use warm the menses, but I'll give you some exa concrete examples. Ignore the last point, that's actually uh, is wrong. Okay. And let's look at blood stasis for a moment. How do you know how do you diagnose blood stasis in a woman? Blood stasis may cause the tongue to be purple, but not always. You can have blood stasis and a normal tongue. And basically, the tongue tells you exactly the degree of blood stasis there is. In the first case, the tongue is completely normal, and the woman has only the symptoms of blood stasis, which gynecologically are painful periods, dark menstrual blood with large dark clots, or even lar dark menstrual blood with large dark clots without pain, even that is a sign of blood stasis. So if a woman has the symptoms of blood stasis and the tongue is normal, that's good. It means that the blood stasis is mild, is mild. The next stage would be that the tongue is purple on the sides, in the liver area. Because in women, the liver area reflects also the uterus. Okay, so that's the next stage, so this is more severe than the first. The last stage is when the tongue, the whole tongue is purple. Okay? So 
so that's the first factor in endometriosis is the biao and the biao the blood stasis prevents the temperature from going down during the period if we look at the temperature charts for a moment oh, no. see here the temperature goes down slightly in endometriosis because there is blood stasis in the uterus it prevents the temperature from going down there on the other hand, here the temperature goes up under the influence of yang. And if a woman has kidney yang shu, it doesn't go up enough. So in endometriosis, the blood stasis prevents it from going down here. And the kidney yang shu prevents it from going up. The result is that it is flat like that. Uh, except, of course, you shouldn't do that little curl there. That's a mistake. Okay, so when the temperature is rather, uh, the line is rather flat like that, it may indicate endometriosis. And I s repeat, it doesn't go down because of the blood stasis, and it doesn't go up because of the kidney yang shu. So the biao is blood stasis, and the ben is a kidney deficiency, more often yang than yin, but it could be yin as well. And the blood stasis, by the way, could be deriving from cold. So the cold has a dual effect. On the one hand, it causes blood stasis, and on the other hand, injures yang. And the third pathogenic factor is in is dampness. And they are more or less in that order of importance. One, blood stasis. Two, kidney yang deficiency. Three, dampness. Okay, let's start again. These are some very simple but very useful sh uh, recommendation for treatment principles. The first one, Tung Xia, simply means you invigorate blood and you choose herbs which have a downward movement. But since you're acupuncturist, you don't have to worry about that. The second one is interesting. To stop pain, calming the heart is important. And that applies to acupuncture too. To stop pain, the heart channel is very important. I use heart seven a lot to stop pain. The third point is very important. You treat both the piao and the ben, i.e. invigorate blood and tonify the kidneys. The fourth point is very important. Invigorated blood alone is not enough. You must treat endometriosis by regulating the four phases. You don't just invigorate blood, but regulate the four phases. Treat according to the four phases. It is essential. And the last point is that you often need to warm the uterus, even if there are no specific signs of cold, in order to ensure the growth of yang in phases three and four. Obviously not if there is liver fire or damp heat. And generally speaking, I treat the ben in phases two and three, i.e. tonify the kidneys, and the biao, I invigorate blood in phases four and one. So treat ben, i.e. tonify kidneys in phases two and three. And you treat biao, i.e. invigorate blood. And as we've seen, invigor invigorate and break blood. in phases uh, four and one. That's the general principle. And I'll give you two or three examples. So rather than looking at individual patterns, the books, when they talk about endometriosis, they give you individual patterns for it, as these. <coughs> OK. 
leaves. Liver blood stasis, stagnation of cold, damp heat, blah, damp phlegm, blah, 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 blah. Rather than doing that, we're going through combinations of patterns because that's what we have in practice. And this is the first one. And in my experience, the women I see with endometriosis, the most common one. Blood stasis, which is the piao. Kidney yang shu is the ben. And dampness is also piao. Dampness there is interesting because it shows the value sometimes of statistics. Because I started uh, making a database of all my patients for the last 10 years, uh, indicating the patterns, the disease, the tongue and pulse. And before I made the database, if someone had asked me what are the patterns in endometriosis, I would have said kidney deficiency and blood stasis not dampness. <laughs> when you make a statistic of all your patients that came to you with endometriosis, you notice that a third of them or a fourth of them have dampness as well. Okay, so dampness is a factor, but I would put it in third order like that, in that order. One blood stasis, two kidney yang shu, three dampness. Okay. So and here it's got the prescriptions rather than the remedies because sometimes my lectures are for three treasures and sometimes they are not. And when they are not about the three treasures, I actually go out of my way not to talk about the three treasures. So, <laughs> so for the menstrual phase here, you use harmonizing the moon. You've got this, have you? Oh no, you don't have any endometriosis here, do you? No. So for the menstrual phase, number one, phase one, you use harmonizing the moon, which is a variation of this. Okay? Not if the period is heavy. If the period is heavy, you use invigorate blood and stem the flow. So I repeat, phase one, use harmonizing the moon if the period is normal or scanty. If the period is heavy, use invigorate blood and stem the flow instead. By the way, the dosage for a case like this, I would say minimum four tablets a day from four to six a day <coughs> in phase one. Phase two, 25 kidney young with unicorn pearl. Phase two and three, phases two and three, 25 kidney young with unicorn pearl. Phase four, you go back to harmonizing the moon. So if the period is heavy, notice, if the period is normal or scanty, you use harmonizing the moon in phases four and one. If the period is heavy, in phase four, you use harmonizing the moon. In phase one, invigorate blood and stem the flow. At some point, you have to use harmonizing the moon because harmonizing the moon is the only remedy that I have for abdominal masses. Is that clear? That. Tongue and pulse are very important signs. Very often I diagnose something on the basis of tongue and pulse only. And in women, in fact, it is very common because a young woman, you know, 24, 25, she will not have backache, dizziness and tinnitus and night sweating and frequent urination, etc., etc. The only kidney young symptoms might be the pulse in the tongue, pale tongue deep, weak kidney pulse. Harmonizing the moon, if they're heavy. But in phase one, invigorate blood and stem the flow. If they're normal or scanty, you use harmonizing the moon in both phases four and one. Okay. 
And this is one example of a common combination of pathogen and endometriosis and treatment according to the phases. The next example is also common. It's, for, it's the same as the first, blood stasis, kidney anxiety and dampness, but blood stasis deriving from cold. And how do we know there is cold in the uterus, by the way? Let's have a, a diversion here. How do you diagnose cold in the uterus? Small dark clots with bright blood. Small dark clots with bright blood. And then when I suspect cold in the uterus, I always ask women, do you feel noticeably colder during the period? And you like a hot water bottle. Okay? That's a very important sign or symptom. The other one is pain. The character of pain when there is cold in the uterus is crampy, spastic, severe, like cramp. And that's about it. Pale tongue. Not much else. Um, and of course, in severe cases of blood stasis from cold, the tongue would be bluish purple, but that's only in severe cases. So how do we change the treatment? In phase one, you, we use harmonizing the moon. Phases two and three, the same. We, uh, we use unicorn pearl. Phase four. We use Wen Jing Tang, which is warm the menses. Instead of harmonizing the moon, warm the menses, which warms the uterus and expels cold from the uterus. So I repeat, first phase one, harmonizing the moon. Phases two and three, unicorn pearl. Phase four, warm the menses. Now, so far we have ignored dampness, as you've noticed. There is dampness, but we haven't used anything for it. Why? Because you can use acupuncture for that. If it is very pronounced, we could do this. We could use, supposing in the same person, dampness is quite pronounced, we could use the same harmonizing the moon in phase one, unicorn pearl in phase two, Clear the palace in phase three. And warm the menses in phase four. So a different one each phase. Harmonizing the moon in phase one. Unicorn pearl phase two. Clear the palace phase three. And warm the menses in phase four. Also drain the jet. Drain the jet valley is more for dampness. But you're treating the bed with the other ones. So. Yeah. Drain the jade valley is more for dampness. Clear the palace is for damp phlegm. That's the difference. But generally speaking, I don't. Do, I only do that if it's very pronounced. Otherwise, I just treat it with acupuncture. Okay, and I think these are the two main examples of cutaneous cord to the face. Then there are many other variations. Yeah, for example, this one has got damp phlegm in the uterus. <coughs> and that's what we just said. Here, there is blood stasis, kidney yang shu. This blood stasis is not from cold, not from cold. Kidney yang shu and pronounced damp phlegm. Harmonizing the moon in phase one. Unicorn pearl in phase two. Clear the palace in phase three, and back to harmonizing the moon in phase four. 
So I repeat, harmonizing the moon, unicorn pearl, clear the palace, and back to harmonizing the moon. The third one was clear the palace, phase three for damp phlegm. And I cannot stress enough how good it is to adapt the treatment principle to the phases. I mean, I had an email from someone in America uh, describing a patient with menstrual headaches, which, by the way, to going back to Bien Bing, if a woman has headaches all the time, the Bien Bing is headaches. But if the woman has headaches only and exclusively during the period, the Bien Bing is not headaches. The Bien Bing is headache during the period, which must be treated, treating the four faces. <coughs> And I don't remember the details, but anyway, this patient from America had clearly menstrual headaches, and I prescribed, I think, four remedies according to the phases, and she wrote back after three months with amazing results she had, just adapting the treatment to the four phases. And the same applies to polycystic ovary. The patterns in polycystic ovary are very similar to um, endometriosis, but with reverse importance. Uh, by the way, acupuncture and herbs are very effective for endometriosis, but it takes a long time, and the patient has to know that. And by a long time, I mean a minimum of a year. It could be two, even three. I've treated several women with infertility for endometriosis depends whether you're using the herbs or not. If you're using the remedies, the frequency of the acupuncture treatment can be reduced to just two a month, or maybe even one a month, two probably. But it takes time. Um, but on the other hand, I'm not against, you know, if a woman wants to have their endometrial, some endometrial tissue removed first and then start the treatment, that's fine. That's fine. Like no, I wouldn't say that they've been so-called cured if they're pain-free, because the pain would react to the treatment fairly quickly. You, don't need, you wouldn't need to wait two years before the pain goes, no. It should go within six months, it might go, because acupuncture herbs are very good for that. So no. No, I keep going. How long? It depends. If they're coming to me for infertility, <laughs> until okay. they're pregnant. So if it's time. not for infertility, how long? I don't know. If, if the tongue is purple, until the tongue is normal. Or if they have a laparoscopy, until there is an objective change in the endometrial lesions. I wouldn't change it, but I would only tell her to stop. stop everything as soon as she knows that she's pregnant. As soon as she knows. Yeah, in the initial stage it's safe, yeah. The question is, is it safe for the patient to repeat the herbs every month without yeah. seeing them? Yes. The yeah. At the moment, now, I don't practice acupuncture anymore. I only use herbal medicine. And in chronic diseases, yeah, you don't need to see the patients. If you've seen them, initially, when you come to me initially, of course, you have to see them every month. But supposing someone comes to me for menopausal problems, I mean, you don't need to see them more than every three months. Um, Endometriosis would be different. Initially, at least initially, I would see them for at least every month, initially. But generally speaking, with herbal medicine, yes, it is safe in a chronic disease to give herbs up to three months without seeing them. But I stress in a chronic long-term problem. 
Okay, let's briefly talk about our polycystic ovary. This is from the Western point of view. Um, we're not concerned with that. Let's interpret the sim symptoms from the Chinese point of view. And these are the main symptoms of it. Scanty periods or no periods due to blood shoot of the Chung and Ren. Blood shoe and kidney shoe because the Tiangui blood is Tiangui, which comes from the kidneys. Hirsutism, the growth of hair, is due to dysfunction of the Chung, Du, and Ren. Interestingly, you know, there's a chapter in the Ling Shu or Su Wen, I forget, where, Qi, where the Yellow Emperor asks Shi Po's quick, short questions. Why do people sneeze? Which, incidentally, he says it's because of the kidneys. Did you know that? In that particular chapter, which ties in with my theory of asthma and allergic rhinitis, he says sneezing is due to the kidneys. Anyway, that's by the, uh, besides the point. It says, why do people sneeze? Why do people bite their tongues and things like that? And one of the questions is, why do men have a beard and women don't? And he says it's because of the chung mai. Because the chung mai goes from the uterus up to the face. And in men, the chung mai has more blood. The blood nourishes the growth of hair. In women, because they lose blood with the period, the chung mai has relatively less blood here, which does not promote the growth of hair. Interestingly, after the menopause, you can have growth of hair, because there's more blood in the chung mai. And also in this disease, in polycystic ovary, because there is scanty periods or amenorrhea, the chung mai has more blood, which nourishes the growth of hair. Yeah, and all over the body, not just the face. Yeah. Obesity is a sign of damp phlegm in Chinese medicine, by definition. And these women are prone to obesis, obesity. However, that does not mean that every woman with polycystic ovary is obese. The variant cysts themselves are a sign of damp phlegm. Again, we are using Western diagnosis to make a Chinese bian ping because the cysts are not palpable. And then in this disease, there is a hormonal imbalance. There is an increase of testosterone, a decrease of estrogen. So there is an imbalance in the chung, du, and ren. Often with too much yang, either in the form of damp heat or liver fire. which is a bit paradoxical because on the one end, they have deficiency of yang, which leads to damp phlegm. But on the other end, they could have damp heat or liver in the liver channel. Yeah, that's an attempt to make a correlation between the Western ovarian hypothalamus pituitary axis, which determines, as you know, the coordination of those three, the ovaries, the hypothalamus and the pituitary, basically regulates the menstrual cycle, which from the Chinese point of view is due to the Du and the Ren. Going back to the Du, the influence of the Du Mei in gynecology is often overlooked, <coughs> but it is as important as the Ren Mei, because as we've seen, uh, the four phases are due to an alternation of yin and yang in theory, but in practice, how does that alternation happen? It happens through the Du and Ren, because the Du and Ren go through the uterus. So how does the increase of Yang happen in the fourth phase? Through the Du Mei. So the Du Mei is as important as the Ren Mei in gynecology. Moreover, if you look at the pathway of the Du Mei, <coughs> it's much more complex than just that line in the back. In fact, it goes to the front as well, to the vagina. That's the path of the Dume. Uh, da, da, da. In women, 
it flows around the vagina, goes to the perineum and then the buttocks and the thighs. So it goes to the front as well. <coughs> what does this mean? That some cases of excessive vaginal discharge, for example, you would immediately think of the Renme, but if this vaginal discharge occurs against the background of Yangshu, pronounced Yangshu, I would treat the Dume with acupuncture as well. Okay. Moreover, chapter 6 of the Su Wen talks about an abdominal branch of the Dume. There. So the Dume arises within the Dantian, the lower abdomen, in the bow. Um, now, where is the abdominal branch? It's here. <coughs> Chapter 6 of the Suwen talks about the abdominal branch of the Dume. Starts in the perineum, goes up the abdomen. See, like the Renme, the umbilicus, heart, throat, chin, around the lips and eyes. So, either this is wrong, that they confuse the Renme with the Dume, or if it is right, the Dume is actually like a circle, it has an abdominal <coughs> branch together with the Renmei. So the point I'm making basically is that both kidney yin and kidney yang influence the uterus and the menstrual function and the kidney yang does that through the Dumei. So do not overlook the importance of the Dumei in gynecology. And that's what this diagram is basically saying that the hormonal balance depends on the Chung, Du and Ren. Chung being blood, Ren may correspond to Yin and Du may to Yang, kidney Yang. And these are the main patterns. The first one, just like blood stasis, was the most important Biao in endometriosis. In polycystic ovary, damp phlegm is the main piao, the most important factor, damp phlegm in the uterus. Second, kidney deficiency, third blood stasis. So as you can see, the patterns are the same as endometriosis, but reversed. That's the main one, damp phlegm. And blood stasis in polycystic ovary is less frequent than is dampness in endometriosis. These are the symptoms of damp phlegm in the uterus. One, excessive vaginal discharge swollen tongue with sticky coating at the root, tendency to obesity, feeling of fullness and heaviness of the lower abdomen, slippery pulse, and often mid-cycle problems, slight pain, heaviness, bleeding. Okay, so damp phlegm is the main pathogenic factor in polycystic ovary. And generally speaking, <coughs> you treat it in phases three and four. Usually, especially three. And the remedy I have is clear the palace, which is a variation of a Chinese remedy called Qi Gong Wan. Dosage the same, I would say between four and six a day. <coughs> or you can go even higher if the damp phlegm is very pronounced and this disease has been there many years. Suppose the woman is quite overweight, there's a lot of damp phlegm, you might want to use nine a day. <coughs> By the way, the, the point to eliminate, eliminate damp phlegm in the uterus is that, stomach 28, Shui Dao, very important point. And these are other points you can use. 
But that's the most important one. Very ancient history of use for infertility. Um, so let's look at the common combination, this one. Then phlegm, kidney, yang, shu, blood stasis. Phases one and four, stir field of elixir. Phase two, unicorn pearl. And phase three, clear the palace. This could be similar to what your patient has. There's more blood stasis than damp phlegm. Phases one and four, stir field of elixir, which should be okay to use because normally when these women the pairs are scanty, not heavy. Phase two, unicorn pearl, and phase three, clear the palace. Would you not clear the palace? If it's not pronounced, if you're sure it's not there in phase three, tonify the kidneys, right. like your patient, you could use in phases two and three, tonify the kidneys, and one and four, invigorate blood. Only that. In a more simple combination, when you have only these two patterns, damp phlegm and kidney yang shu, it's very simple. Uh, <coughs> Phase two, 25 kidney young with unicorn pearl. And phase three and four, maybe, clear the palace. So phase two, <coughs> unicorn pearl. Phases three and four, clear the palace. Nothing in phase one. The dosage <laughs> I said, four to six, you can go up to nine. Again, it will take a long time, one year minimum up to two or three. <coughs> very? Very skinny, she exercises a lot. And that's not good. That weakens kidney young. That's probably the cause of it. Yes, but I can't make her. <laughs> I had a woman like that, a woman who was a professional athlete with cold in the uterus and kidney young shoe with infertility. And I forgot what I gave her. I think I gave her a variation of uh, warm lamentus, <coughs> Wen Jing Tang. Plus, and she did follow my advice to reduce the exercise drastically, which she did. And she got pregnant within one year. So, excessive exercise is a serious cause of Yang Shu in women. Okay, let's talk about the menopausal uh, remedies because they're very useful, I would say. As an acupuncturist, that's a very useful addition because acupuncture is good for menopausal problems, but the disadvantage of it is that you have to give a lot of treatment, very frequent treatment for a long time. So it's not practical and expensive. There's an interesting thing about the menopause, which I find interesting, is that, that the same chapter of the Neijing that says at 14, the Tiangui arrives, it says at 49, seven times seven, the Tiangui dries up and the woman can't conceive anymore. That's interesting because it gives the age for the menopause age for 49, and statistically, it is about 50 in the West which is as not, in other words, the Su Wen was written about 100 BC, so the menopausal age has not changed. And it doesn't change between the West and the East, because for example, in Malaysian women, the curse of 50.7. I find that interesting, why? Because how did these people know 
that the menopause occurs at 49 when most women would have died at 35. How did they know? If, we, if it's true what they say, the life expectancy then would have been about 35. Yes, that's true. I thought. Who lived to 35 would have lived longer. Yeah, that's one reason, yeah. Because those statistics, the average age is reduced by the high more infant mortality. That's true. But I think there's also another reason. The Neijing keeps referring to a golden age in the past, when people lived to 100 years. That's how the Neijing starts, the Su Wen starts. The Yellow Empress asks Chipo, why is it that in the old times, in the good old times, people lived to 100? It actually says that. And nowadays they don't. And that's a constant theme in Chinese medicine. They always refer to a golden age in the past when people, and I think that golden age did exist. There is no proof of it, but I personally think it did. And that's why these people knew that the menopause occurs at 49. Um, and the other thing I find interesting that it has not changed over 2,000 years, which would indicate what? That it's not culturally determined, as anthropologists would like to tell us, but determined by cosmic cycles, which are unchanged, unchangeable, because they're cosmic cycles from 2,000 years ago. Um, but the other interesting conclusion from this is that the menopause, and it's a very important conclusion, is not a disease. It is a transitional, a normal <coughs> physiological transitional stage. When the Tiangui dries up, the Chung and Ren decline, and the kidney Jing declines, and it's not a disease. So it only requires treatment when the symptoms are pronounced. And usually the, sim the reason that the symptoms are pronounced is from a pre-existing kidney deficiency. That's why the most important service you can provide to your women patients, I counsel women about the menopause, I counsel young women about the menopause. I do it all the time. A woman comes to me, she's 35, I tell her, this is the time to do something about your menopause. That is the time. To change your diet, exercise, stop smoking, that is the time. When you're 55, it's too late. <coughs> Obviously, I don't tell my 55-year-old patients that, but <laughs> <laughs> it's never too late, but it's much better if you start when you're 30. So that's what you should do to your young women patients, to talk about the menopause. That is the time. For example, calcium, osteoporosis. You help it with dietary changes, but only if you start when you're 30, not when you're 55. It's too late. The, your calcium in your bones is determined by your diet then, in your 20s. Uh, another thing I'd like to clear up, it is not true what I hear. You hear that especially in America, that the menopausal symptom is due to kidney yin shu. It is not true is kidney jing shu, which would be yin or yang. Otherwise, women with kidney yang shu would not have menopausal symptoms, but they do. Okay, so what happens is this. I don't know if I got the diagram here. No, this is not. Um, yeah, it's better if we look at this one here. So that's basically what happens. This is a warmer kidney yin shu, okay, a pre-existing kidney yin shu. And this is very easy to explain. It's got a lot of empty heat, okay. But you see the yang is also below the line. So she may have cold feet. It happens all the time. A woman with yin shu, a lot of empty heat, but she has cold feet or frequent urination. It's because of that. Here, this is a menopausal woman who has primarily kidney yang shu. 
So she has a lot of kidney yang shu symptoms, but she also has empty heat because of that, because the yin is also deficient. And that's the rule rather than the exception, i.e. they are both deficient with the predominance of one or the other. And generally speaking, it's about 50-50. About half of my menopausal women I treat have kidney yang shu. And the tongue is very important to differentiate these two. And I think I've got, uh, yeah. The tongue indicating yin shu can have many different manifestations. The mildest is that, rootless coating, normal color. That's the mildest form of yin shu. And the most severe is that coating completely missing and red all over. And anything in between. If yang shu is predominating, the tongue would definitely be pale. So there's a very simple rule. In menopausal women, menopausal women tonify kidney yang if the tongue is definitely pale. In any other case, tonify kidney yin. Okay. I repeat, if the tongue is definitely pale, tonify kidney yang. In any other case, even if the tongue is normal, nourish kidney yin. And generally speaking, if the menopausal symptoms are pronounced, it is always due, it's not menopausal, it's due to a pre-existing kidney deficiency. And by the way, 50% of menopausal symptoms are not menopausal. They're just a disharmony. A disharmony. Do you know what I mean? Which they would have anyway. Because what happens with the menopause is similar you know, to what happens in children. Have you heard of the qi mechanism? Qi ji? The qi mechanism, qi, basically, you know, qi has four movements ascending and descending and entering and exiting, you know, like a cross, going up and going down, but she also enters and exits as a horizontal movement, which is not often mentioned. We are familiar with the fact that she goes up and down, the stomach, she goes down, spring, she goes up, but she also enters and exits in every part of the body. Okay, there's a horizontal movement. Those four movements, those complex of four movements are called the chi mechanism, chi ji. And one of the characteristics of children is that the qi ji is easily upset. Any little pathology disturbs the qi ji. That's why children are always vomiting. Whatever they have, they vomit <laughs> because of the qi ji. In an adult, it doesn't happen. You know, we seldom vomit when we're ill. A children gets a cold and he vomits, flu and he vomits. And, uh, that's because the qi ji, the qi mechanism, is delicate and qi goes easily off the rails. And I would say, in a lesser, to a lesser extent, it happens with the menopause as well, i.e. with this relatively sudden decline of kidney jing, qi goes off the rails. It may go up, for example. It may, the menopause may trigger off this qi mechanism going off the rails. So, for example, the qi of the chung mei goes up, and it aggravates the hot flushes. But those hot flushes are not 50% are menopausal, but the other 50% is the rebellious qi of the Chung Mei, which is not menopausal, if you know what I mean. Okay. Also, you should not forget that every menopausal woman has pre-existing patterns, which again are exposed with the onset of the menopause, which may have been hidden before. The rebellious qi of the Chung Mei is an important one. Phlegm is another. I find that phlegm aggravates hot flushes. Uh, very common. So don't forget that, that the menopause derails the qi mechanism. So roughly half of those symptoms, strictly speaking, are not menopausal, but they are due to other disharmonies which may be caused by the qi going off the rails with the menopause. Another example of qi going off the rails is after surgery. That also causes 
the chi mechanism to be upset. That's why also people vomit. When you wake up from an anesthetic, usually you vomit. That's because of that. And I think the menopause does that as well to women. And the sweating, for example, is also due to a disarmament of the chi entering and exiting. You know? You know the space between skin and muscles? The solely space? Chi goes in and out of the space of our skin pores. That's a horizontal movement. Entering and exiting of chi. And the proper entering and exiting of chi regulates sweating. Too much entering causes no sweating. Too much exiting causes too much sweating. So with the menopause, there is also that, a derailment of this entering and exiting of chi. And that's why they sweat. Okay? So the remedies I use, uh, these are examples of degree of yin shu. That would be the mildest, i.e. rootless coating, normal color no coating, red center no coating, red body no coating, and then red body deep cracks. All those would call for nourishing kidney yin. And these are the remedies I use. <coughs> That's the one I use most of all. And in fact, that is at the one of the, um, I think, is among the top three remedies, is the journey yin. And it's a variation of Zhuogui one. And is the journey yin, is in fact similar to nourish the root, the kidney yin tonic. But it's modified uh, very much to clear empty heat is the journey yin. As I said, if the tongue is definitely pale, use is the journey yang instead. Now, there are two or three questions arising. Is the dosage, how long do you use them for, do you combine it with HRT or not? How long do you use them for? I would say forever. <laughs> I, I take kidney tonics all the time, every day. When after 50, everyone sh should take a kidney tonic. So the menopause is not something that's going to be cured. Because these remedies are not like HRT. What they do is to minimize the, effect, the side of the effects of the menopause and assist in that transition by gently tonifying the kidneys. And men can do that as well. So how long should they take them for? I would say the true answer is forever. And there is no contraindication in doing that. The only, the only caution is that if a patient is taking a remedy for many years, like this one, for example, say two or three years, stop it for a month every six months, just to be safe on the safe side. How long you stop, stop it for one month every six, just to be safe. And how do you know if you can stop them? I mean, when you stop for a month, do you go back automatically? Or do you say, well, I want to see if the patient is doing all right? Or no, no, I would stop them purely for being extra cautious, that we don't know. There are no studies that sh uh, indicate what side effects you might have from taking Chinese herbs for three years. Mm -hmm. That's why I stopped them. But as I said, the real answer to the question, forever. forever. <coughs> because, I mean, with age, after 50, kidney gene declines. So everyone can take a kidney tonic to slow it down. That's all you can do. That's true, but that doesn't... Not only that, I have seen old people, very old people, people in their 70s and 80s with no kidney deficiency. Occasionally, I have seen it. No backache, dizziness, tinnitus, perfect hearing, sight. You know, I, it does happen, but it's more the exception. Okay, so that's the main one I use. And these two are 
for two other possible configuration of patterns. Menopausal. This is for liver and kidney issue with liver yang rising. What are the two symptoms that tell you you should use this remedy? One is headaches, two irritability. And some eye symptoms. One headache, three. One headaches, two irritability, three some eye symptoms. Dry eyes, for example. Then you use female treasure instead of is the journey in. Did you use that in this stage three? Yeah. No, I would say primary two and three. As well. As well. Heavenly Empress is a variation of the famous Tian Wang Pu Xin Dan, which is for, actually you should add here, liver yin, kidney yin, and heart yin. So liver yin, kidney yin, and heart yin, and clear heart empty heat. And what are the symptoms that tell you you should use this? Some heart symptoms, i.e. palpitations, poor memory, insomnia, anxiety, palpitations, insomnia, poor memory, anxiety. Interestingly, I have a colleague in the United States in Los Angeles who in her experience, her menopausal women, she uses Heavenly Empress much more than the others. And it's probably because in California, people have a lot of yin shu and empty heat. Two, what you do if the woman is taking HRT. Contrary to what I said about endometriosis and polycystic ovary, I do combine these remedies with HRT <coughs> initially. The woman doesn't have to stop HRT to take these. Because HRT is different than the endometriosis and polycystic ovary treatment because the HRT contains a very small dose of estrogen. Obviously, in the long term, there's no point in taking both. Either you have one or the other, and there's not much point in taking both. Um, but initially, the woman, if she's on HRT, she doesn't have to stop it immediately, which will lead to an increase in hot flushes. But eventually, I would always advise women against it because I think modern women are subject to a lot of hormonal manipulation. And the less you have, the better it is. And this came to me when I, I, when you read Chinese articles on breast cancer, they always say the pathology, one of the pathologies is disharmony of Chung and Ren. And I could never understand what do they mean by disarmony of children and Ren. And then it occurs to me that as you know, modern women, they have dozens of causes for a disarmony of children and Ren due to the hormonal manipulation from the beginning, from hormones in the food and chicken, hormones in the environment, the contraceptive pill, the morning after pill, the coil, then they may decide to have children, they have assisted fertility, they take Clomid, and then they have HRT. So there's a huge amount of hormonal manipulation, and I think the less you have, the better. Would you change interchange between the journey and the female treasure if there's... Yes, you can combine this, too, and I was going to talk about it, a combination. What was the other questions I asked? How long do you take them for? Do you combine it with HRT? Dosage. The dosage. Dosage is low because it's a chronic problem. Uh, I would say f not more than four a day. Two and two. Two in the morning, two in the evening? No. If it is yin, the one that treats yin, afternoon and evening. No, the one that treats young morning and afternoon. But that's to be precise, you know, and not, not essentially. Is the journey young? I would advise to take morning and afternoon. The other three, afternoon and evening. 
And then I often combine these remedies. Uh, these two, for example, I combine. When do I combine them? I combine them usually when the woman has a predominantly a deficiency of kidney yang, but the situation is very complex. The mixture of yin shu and yang shu is quite complex. She has a pale tongue, but the empty heat symptoms are very pronounced, hot flushes. In that case, I would combine the two and would give is the journey young in morning and afternoon, say two and two, and maybe just even one only of is the journey yin in the evening. And I do that very frequently. How long do you expect to see before at that dosage you see a change in the hot flushes? Not long. Not long. Weeks rather than months. Really? Acupuncture is good too. Yeah. It's very good, but you have to treat every week, and it's not practical and expensive. Have you ever had a woman not, who has kidney yin symptoms not respond to herbal medicine? This ones? Or herbal medicine in general? Just in general, yin tonics. So. I don't think I can generalize unless I have specific examples. Generally speaking, the answer is no. But there can be many reasons why a patient is not reacting. Mm. So it's difficult to answer that question. But in the specific example of menopausal symptoms, I would say that I've never seen a case when these remedies did not do something. Um, could do. It could do. A little bit, yeah. It could do. But that's not a bad thing. <laughs> yes, but you tell that Obese women have less menopausal problems, you know that. Yeah. Because the very small, the fat cells secrete minute amounts of estrogen. But they, they, as soon as you say that, they will constipate. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but occasionally, I might combine these as well. Yeah. For example, a woman has headaches, but she has a pronounced kidney yin shu. I might use, say, four of these, the journey yarn, and two female treasure, or vice versa. Very often, uh, sorry, just to interrupt you, occasionally, in, as I said, menopausal symptoms are due, 50% are due, are menopausal. The other 50 are not menopausal. And if the woman has a complex condition, she has phlegm, for example, I may use a prescription for her, not one of these remedies, a prescription that treats the whole Disharmony, but something I do do in menopausal women very often to give them a prescription and then also a small dose of one of these, just two tablets in the evening of one of these to treat the menopausal aspect of it and the hot flushes. A very common thing is the presence of phlegm, which aggravates menopausal symptoms. Let's talk about Bangalore because it's difficult to treat. It's common. Uh, Bangalore means heavy periods, but it is different heavy periods. Going back to Bian, Bian Bing, these are two different Bing, two different diseases. Heavy periods in Bangalore are two different diseases, and that is the difference. This is a normal period. That's a heavy period, and this is Bangalore. And you can see the difference. The difference is that in Bangalore, the bleeding is heavier. It may start early and continue well beyond the five days and go on trickling. And in fact, Bangalore are, <coughs> are two separate symptoms. Bang is flooding and low is trickling. So that's actually bang. And this is low. Okay. The basic pathology boils down to two. Um, now let's talk about this for a moment. The difference between being low and heavy periods. The pathology is the same. But what is the difference in practice between these two? Is that in being low, 
the Chung and Ren are more chaotic. And that's how the Chinese books express it. They're chaotic and destabilized. The Chinese word is Pu Gu. Chung and Ren, Pu Gu, means without a root, not consolidated or destabilized. Which means two things. A, it is more difficult to treat because of that. It will take longer. And B, you need to so-called consolidate Chung and Ren, whatever the pattern. Consolidate Chung and Ren. Which with herbal medicine means using kidney yang tonics, like Xu Duan, for example, Dipsicus. Consolidates Chung and Ren. So you would add Xu Duan even if she has Yin Shu or blood heat, for example. To consolidate Chung and Ren. With acupuncture, consolidating Chung and Ren is very easy. You just do Ren 4, <laughs> Ren 4 and kidney 13, consolidate Chung and Ren. In terms of pathology, there are two major pathologies blood heat and Chi Shu. Okay? But I've got five remedies. Why we've got five remedies if there are two pathologies? Because there is two sub pathologies. Let's see. Um, it's not here. Because blood heat in chronic conditions with yin shu could be blood empty heat. Okay, so there's two separate remedies for that. The remedies for bleeding from blood heat is cool the menses. Let's, I've got a list here. Mm. No, I don't have a list here. Ah, oh, yes, here. So those are the remedies. As you can see, there is five, but these two are kind of part of the same pathology. The first two, blood heat. The first is blood heat. The second is empty heat in the blood. So you could put these two together. The bleeding is from heat, basically. Whether it's full or empty heat, this bleeding is from heat. <coughs> and I use the first one much more than the second one. <coughs> and if you look at the fourth and fifth, you can put these two together as well. Because the bleeding here is from Qi Shu. The difference is that this is bleeding from Qi Shu, this is bleeding from Qi and Yin Shu. But I use the fourth one much more than the fifth one. So is that clear? So there are two major pathologies. Either the blood leaks out, comes out because it's hot, and the Chinese call it reckless, which is the case in the first two, or the blood leaks out because qi does not hold it, which is the case, case in the last two. In the first case, qi shu, in the second, qi and yin shu. The fifth one um, is for blood stasis. And how can blood stasis cause bleeding? Through this mechanism. Imagine this is the uterus, the red box is the uterus. And the uterus is of the blood vessels of the uterus are obstructed by its stagnant blood. Okay? New blood is being made all the time and it can't enter the uterus because it's obstructed by stagnant blood, so it leaks out and you have heavy periods. So paradoxically, you can have heavy periods or bleeding in other parts of the body from blood stasis. 
obviously in the case of the uterus, this arrow here, this line here, should actually go through the red box, obviously, because the blood comes through the uterus. However, blood stasis is seldom the cause of bleeding by itself. By itself. It usually aggravates the bleeding from tissue or from blood heat. In the case history I just mentioned briefly this morning, with this woman with bunglow from Chishu, the only thing that stopped it was invigorate blood and stem the flow, i.e. the remedy that invigorates blood. So never underestimate or overlook blood stasis in women. Always check, look for it in the tongue, also in the veins under the tongue, in the symptoms, the color of the blood. Okay? So going back to those remedies, that's why we have five remedies. Two from, chish from blood heat, two from tissue, and the fifth for excessive bleeding with blood stasis. Now, supposing a woman was bleeding from blood heat, I would use cool demenses when, primarily in phases four and one. So if you remember those lines, the yin and yang lines, she's bleeding a lot from blood heat, that means there was excessive yang in the fourth phase, there's too much yang, and that causes the blood to flow out of the vessels. So, that's the time to use cool demenses in phases four and one. If she was bleeding from chishu, I would probably use restrain the flow. And that's a bit different because that tonifies kidney chi as well. I would use that primarily in phase one itself, the period itself, and just tonify the kidneys at other times with either unicorn pearl or strengthen the root. Because remember what Dr. Xia says, the second phase it's very important to establish a good menstrual cycle, and this is a good example of it. You're treating this woman for heavy bleeding, so why do we treat her after the period? Because of that. Because the second phase is important to establish a good menstrual cycle, and because we need to consolidate the Chung and Ren. So I would use restrain the flow only in phase one, and tonify the kidneys in phases two and three, and maybe nothing in phase four. If there was blood stasis, then I would use that in phases four and one, in big red blood and stem the flow. Now, why is this difficult to treat? It's difficult, Bengalo, because in some cases, when it's very severe, the woman is bleeding all the time. And sometimes she can't even tell when she has a period and she doesn't have a period. And that makes the treatment very difficult, because it makes it very difficult to treat according to the faces. Very difficult. It's very much trial and error. What I usually do, I usually tell them to kind of identify when the bleeding seems to be heavier and that would be the period of phase one and then switch to phase two basically seven or nine days after that even if she has low if she has trickling I ignore that if she has trickling you don't have to concentrate so much on stopping bleeding just ignore it and treat according to the phases so in this example, if she was bleeding a lot and the situation is confusing, when she has heavy bleeding, use cool demenses 
Then about seven, nine days after that, switch to tonifying the kidneys. And the other reason why this disease is difficult to treat is that the heavy blood loss, which goes on for some years, leads to further disharmonies, which may lead you to the wrong diagnosis. And I'll give you an example here. This is one of the reasons why this uh, gives a complex pathology, but actually the most common one is not there. And the most common one would be this case history. A woman is breathing from blood heat, okay? After many years of blood loss, blood is the mother of chi. And she develops blood shoe and chi shoe because of the blood loss. So she comes to you, she's pale, tired, weak, the pulse is choppy, you diagnose that bleeding is from blood shoe and chi shoe. That's an extra case I have in mind. And it was wrong. Because that, what, what you were treating, the blood shoe and chi shoe, is the result of bang low and not the cause of it. You understand what I mean? When that happens, when there are no results, I usually check the diagnosis. You go back to the diagnosis and check the tongue more carefully. You realize it is very slightly red. You ask whether she has thirst and she says yes, which you did not ask before because she had such obvious symptoms of chi and blood sugar. And you realize she had blood heat. And the blood shoe and chi shoe were the result of Bangalore not the cause of it, okay? So that's why Bangalore can, you can get, easily get the wrong diagnosis because when you look at the symptoms, when we look at that, uh, um, this, the difference between chi shoe, the symptoms of chi shoe and blood heat are so obvious, you know, blood heat, the tongue should be red, thirst, insomnia, agitation, blah, 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 rapid pulse. And she shoe weak, pulse, pale tongue, pale face, blah, 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 blah. It seems obvious, doesn't it? But you get easily confused because the heavy bleeding for many years leads to further pathologies. And the one I gave you is a common one. These are others. This woman is breathing from blood heat, but blood is part of yin. So that leads to yin shoe which leads to empty heat. So after 10 years, she's got both blood heat and blood empty heat. I've seen that too. Or this, she's bleeding from chi shu. She is the mother of blood. She develops blood shu and blood empty heat, and so on and so forth. So that's another reason why Bangalore is difficult to treat. It easily leads to the wrong diagnosis. And the other reason it is difficult to treat sometimes, that is, if it's very severe, it is difficult to treat according to the phases. This is an example when I would use a higher dose. We just said, for example, for the menopausal remedies, we said not more than for a day. These, you definitely need more than for a day. For example, say you're treating a woman for bleeding from blood heat, you want to treat in phases four and one, you definitely need six, probably nine a day, if not more. Six to nine, I would say. Which follows the general principle that in full conditions, you use higher doses than empty <coughs> conditions. Okay, I think we'll stop here. What about Bangla? Ah, these are the points to stop bleeding with acupuncture. Which points stop bleeding in acupuncture? All the she cleft points and all the Luo points. In the case of the uterus, the three channels would be spleen, liver, and kidneys. So the Luo points of spleen, liver, and kidneys, 
and the she cleft points of liver and kidneys. You don't have to write down all those points, they're quite obvious points. Um, just remember the points that stop bleeding. Okay, I think we'll stop. All right. Thank you. Get up and do my bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.